Okay, we are going to continue talking about probability, and today we're going to focus on the probability of compound events, meaning events that we have, we're talking about the probability of more than one thing occurring rather than just one thing at a time. For example, Mr. and Mrs. Smith have two children. What is the probability they had a boy and then had a girl? Okay, so option number one in order to figure this out is just list it, right? So we've got first kid could be a boy, second kid could be a boy, first kid could be a boy, second kid could be a girl. Or first kid's a girl, second kid's a boy, or both kids are girls, right? So those are the only options that we have for having two children. Boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, or girl, girl. How many of them have the probability of having a boy and then having a girl? Well, that's got to be just this one, right? That's one positive outcome out of four total outcomes, so 25%. So the other question is, calculate it. So is there a way we could take the probability of having a boy and the probability of having a girl and use an operation to combine those two and end up with 25%? I'll let you guess and see if you can figure out what that would be. We're going to come up with that here in just a second. Okay. So this will work because these compound events are what are called independent. So that definition and a few others are right here. A compound event is made up of two or more simple events. A simple event is like having a boy, or flipping a coin and getting tails, or rolling a die and getting a four, or pulling a card out of a deck and getting a jack, right? One thing happening is a simple event. A compound event is two of them, like rolling a three and flipping heads. That's a compound event where we have two different things that need to happen. Joint probability is the probability of compound events. It's how we calculate what's the likelihood of this set of things occurring. Independent events are two events that the where one outcome has no effect on the outcome of the other. So that could be like flipping a coin and then pulling a card out of a deck, right? Getting heads on your coin flip has no influence whatsoever on whether or not you pull a queen out of the deck. They are completely unrelated. Dependent events happen when the outcome of one does have an effect on the other. So if you think about you're pulling uh, marbles out of a sock, and there's four blue ones and three red ones, right? So a dependent event would be pulling two marbles out but not replacing the first one. So if I reach into the, to the hat or the sock or whatever and I pull out a blue marble, the probability of the next marble being blue has changed because I've taken a marble out, right? The set of possible outcomes has changed. So when the first outcome influences the second event, that is a dependent event. One event depends on the other. Two events are independent if the outcome of one has no effect on the outcome of the other. Okay, go ahead and pause this if you need a second. Otherwise, I'm going to keep moving to figure out which operation we need to combine independent events. Okay, so if two events are independent, then the probability of both events occurring is the product of the probability of A and the probability of B. Pro product, remember, obviously, the, the answer to a multiplication problem. So if I want to know what the probability of A and B happening is, I'm going to multiply the probability of A times the probability of B. So the idea of having a boy and then a girl, probability of having a boy, one half. The probability of having a girl as your second child has no has nothing to do with the first one. So the probability of having a girl, also one half. If I multiply those two together, I get one fourth or the 25% we had before, right? So this is why that works. If two events are dependent, then the probability of both events occurring is the product of the probability of A and then the probability of B, but after A has occurred. That will make more sense when we see an example. Um, again, I'm gonna keep moving, pause this if you need some more time with this slide. So state whether each event is independent or dependent, and then calculate its probability. So number one, we roll two dice. Find the probability you roll a six and an odd number. So does the outcome of one of the dice have any impact on the outcome of the other one? It shouldn't, right? Getting a three on one of the dice does not mean I can't get a three on the other one, for example. So let's look at the probability of the first thing. So roll a six. Well, there's only one six on the die, and that's out of six total po po uh, possibilities. So the probability of rolling a six is one sixth. And then rolling an odd number. Well, the odd numbers on a die are one. Well, let's see, all the numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So the odd numbers are one, three, and five. So there are three positive outcomes and six total. 
to calculate the joint probability, we're going to multiply those. 1 times 3 is 3. 6 times 6 is 36. So that's 1 out of 12. If we find the decimal, 1 divided by 12, we're going to end up with 0 0.083 repeating, or approximately 8.3%, uh, repeating third percent, really. Okay. Those are independent events because the outcome of the first die has nothing to do with the second one. Number two, you draw three cards from a deck without replacing. This is super important. So we're going to draw a card. We're going to hold it while we draw another card. So we're changing the deck each time we draw, right? So we want the probability of getting the three cards in this order. So first, before we do that, we got to talk a little bit about a deck of cards. There are four suits, right? We've got diamonds. This is probably not going to go well. We got clubs. Then we have hearts and spades. There are two colors. Red and black. Each of the four suits has the numbers, uh, has an ace, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. For a total of 13 cards in each suit, for a total 52 cards. You might want to copy that down if you're not very familiar with a deck of cards, because when we do a lot of probability questions, that's going to come up a lot. So let's get back to the question. Probability of getting a diamond, and then a club, and then not a club. So let's start with the probability of getting a diamond. There are 52 cards in the deck at this moment, and there are 13 diamonds. A fourth of them are diamonds, so 13 diamonds. Okay, um, that is one fourth. One out of every four cards is a diamond. Okay. The probability of getting a club is going to be the same. There are 13 clubs, and all 13 of them are still in the deck because we are assuming I pulled a diamond. So this is where we talk about the probability of B assuming that A occurred, right? So the probability of B in this case is getting a club after A, our diamond occurs. So we're assuming that this guy's, a, that this first one's a diamond, meaning that there's a club, there are still 13 clubs left. However, there are no longer 52 cards because we're holding one. There are only 51 cards now. Okay, so that's what it means by the probability after the first event occurs. We've removed a card, bringing the total to 51, and we're going to assume that that first card was a diamond, which means there are still 13 clubs, okay? Then the third thing is not a club. So as you might guess, there are only 50 cards left in the deck now. So we've now drawn two of them. So we've... All the not a clubs would be the 52 cards minus the 13 clubs. Yes? So there should be uh, third, 39. Should be 39 cards that are not clubs. We've pulled one of the not clubs out, right? Because we have a diamond. The other card we pulled was a club, so it did not affect this number. So there should be 38 not clubs left. We took out a diamond, so there's 12 diamonds. We've got all 13 spades. We didn't pull out any spades. And we have all 13 hearts, okay? So now we want to try and reduce these as much as we can. Now, obviously, this one was easy. Let me change colors again here. All right, can you see this? Yeah. This one was easy. So we're going to have one fourth. I wouldn't reduce unless it's, it's obvious, right? So 13 out of 51, that's going to stay that way. And then 38 out of 50, I know I could divide them both by 2, so let's do that much. We're going to end up with 19 on top and 25 on the bottom. Okay, we're going to multiply all those together because we want the probability that all three of these things happen. So 1 times 13 times 19 is going to be 247 on top, and 4 times 51 times 25 for the bottom is exactly 5100. 
Now we want the percent probably because that decimal or that fraction doesn't really mean anything to me. So 247 divided by 5100 is going to give me 4 point point. Let's do this. 0 0.04843. So we'll make that equal to there, and then that's approximately 4.43 percent. So the chances of drawing three cards from a deck that are a diamond, then a club, and then not a club are about four. 0.4%. So it's only going to happen about four times if you try it a hundred different times. Okay. This one's going to be a yo-yo, so let's see how well we're picking up on this stuff. This one seems like it might be a bit of a trick, so read it carefully. State whether each is independent or dependent, and then calculate the probability. So, a search and rescue team believes there is a 40% chance a plane went down in the following area. What is the probability that it went down in this area and then landed in the forest? So go ahead and pause this, take a minute or two, and figure out whether it's dependent or independent, and then find the probability. I'm just going to write independent or dependent while you work. Okay, if you're not done, go ahead and make sure you pause while you work. I'm going to get started. There is a 40% chance a plane went down in the following area, and then what is the probability it went down in this area and landed in the forest? So here are the two events that I see. Probability that it went down in this area, and then B, landed in the forest. Those are two different things. So does the probability of it landing in the forest have to do with the fact that it landed in this area? I would think it does drastically. Because I don't know what it looks like out here or out here. I have no idea what it, how much of that is forest. So this is very much dependent. Okay. Uh, what is the probability it went down in this area? So that's the first question. Well, if there's a 40% chance it went down in this area, then I'm going to say that's 40% or 0.4 as my first thing, right? And multiply by something else. Okay. Then the second part, it landed in the forest. How much of this area is forest? Because if it landed, if we know it lands in this box, it has three places to land. So is that one out of three? Well, no, because the forest is obviously twice as big as the water or the grass, right? There are four squares here. Two of them are forest. So two-fourths, or one-half, 0.5, is forest. So 0.4 times 0.5 gives us 0.2, or 20% chance that the plane landed, went down in this area and landed in the forest. A little bit more vocab. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot occur at the same time. If two events are mutually exclusive, then the probability that either one of them occurs is the sum of their probabilities. So if the two things can't happen at the same time, you add their probabilities together. If the two things can happen at the same time, we have to add a little bit of a step. Okay, so mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. Here's a Venn diagram showing that if you're in B, you cannot be in A. And if you're in A, you cannot be in B, right? There's no overlap. So the probability of those two things, of A or B happening, is just the probability of A plus the probability of B. So, for example, you are on Park Place. This is a Monopoly board, right? So we are here. You are here. And we're going this way, for those of you that aren't familiar with Monopoly. What is the probability that you land on or pass go? So we're going to roll a die, right? And we can get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. We need to go 1, 2, 3 to get here. And then 4, 5, and 6 would all take us past it. Notice it says the probability that you land on or past go. Now, can you land on and past go? No. I either land on this square or I land past it, right? Obviously, I could land short of it, but that's not what we're talking about. So we need to talk about the probability of getting a 3 and add the probability of getting a 4, 5, or 6. Because those are the two things that will get us a success for this question. Okay, so what's the probability of rolling a die and getting a 3? Well, that's 1 out of 6. There are 6 numbers. One of them is a 3. Plus, there are 6 numbers down here. 3 of them would take us past go, right? 
So four sixths or two thirds or sixty seven percent. Sixty six point six repeating, right? So if you're on Park Place, there is a two-thirds chance, a 67% chance that you will hit go or go past it. And for those of you that have played Monopoly, you know that that's important because you collect money when you land on or go past go. So that's why that would be important. Okay, these events are mutually exclusive. I can either land on go or I can go past it, but it's impossible to land on it and go past it at the same time. It's one or the other. So that's why they're mutually exclusive, and that's why we just add these two probabilities. Okay. You're on community chest. What is the probability that you land on free parking or chance? Now, so we're down here. This is us. We want to know what happen, What are the chances of landing at free parking or at chance? And we're going this way. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to figure out what number do I need to roll to get to free parking? Well, that'd be a 1, 2, or a 3. And then to get to chance, I need to get a 5, right? Can I land on free parking and chance? Nope, that's not how board games work. So I need the probability of getting a 3 and add the probability of getting a 5. So one thing we should talk about is this notation. It looks kind of like function notation. When we're talking about probability, we use it to show the probability of getting a 3 or the probability of getting a 5. Okay. So what's the probability of rolling a 3? Well, that's 1 out of 6. And we're going to add the probability of getting a 5, which is 1 out of 6. One thing that I will caution you to be aware of, this is not 3 out of 6. right? You might be incorrectly tempted to write a 3 out of 6 because we're trying to roll a 3. Or to write a 5 out of 6 because we're trying to roll a 5. Just keep reminding yourself, I want the number of successes over the number of total possibilities. So how many ways are there to get a 3? 1. How many ways are there to get a 5? 1. Gives me a total of 2 sixths or 1 third or 33.3%. .3%. Okay. But what if I asked you to find the probability of drawing a card from a deck and asking you the probability of drawing a 2 or a diamond? Now these are not mutually exclusive because a card can be both a 2 and a diamond at the same time. This Venn diagram, I think, does a really good job of explaining that because if you know, if you look carefully, there should be four twos in the deck, right? One for each suit: a spade, a club, a heart, and a diamond. And there are thirteen diamonds: ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. The two of diamonds exists in both circles. It is a two, and it is a diamond. So the probability of drawing a two or a diamond gets a little bit trickier. We have the probability of drawing a two, and we're going to add the probability, whoops, probability of drawing a diamond. The problem, that's a terrible diamond, I'm sorry. The problem is the two of diamonds is in both circles. So we counted it once here and a second time here. Right? And I can't have the same card being counted twice. So what we're going to have to do is subtract the probability that both things happen. So subtract the probability of the two of diamonds. So let's look at what this looks like. Probability of drawing a two. Well, there are four twos and 52 cards, right? And the probability of drawing a diamond. There are 13 diamonds and 52 cards. But the two of diamonds is counted here, right? Because one, one of the four twos is the two of diamonds. The two of diamonds is also counted over here because it's a one of the 13 diamonds. So we need to subtract the chances of getting the two of diamonds. So there's only one of those out of the 52 cards. So what we're going to end up with is 4 plus 13, which is 17 minus 1, which is 16 out of the 52. Remember, the denominator doesn't change when we add or subtract fractions. It has to be a common denominator. So this could be 8 out of 26, or 4 out of 13. So there's a 4 in 13 chance. If I turn that into a decimal, 4 divided by 13, we're getting a 
30.76. So 30.8% chance that I will draw a two or a diamond. Not the two of diamonds. That's a one in 52 chance. But the probability of drawing a two or a diamond is actually pretty high. It's going to happen about one out of every three times. Okay, so the difference between this one where we just add the two probabilities and this one where we add the two probabilities and then subtract the probability of them both happening, this is because these are not mutually exclusive, right? Not mutually exclusive. These are mutually exclusive. These can both these cannot both happen. These can both happen. Okay. So, like we just talked about, the probability of A or B happening when they are not mutually exclusive is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And to do this, it's the probability of A times the probability of B, right? Because that's a compound event with an and. So, kind of a the, the key I would leave you with here is in probability, if you see the word and, you're going to multiply. If you see the word or, you're going to add and maybe subtract. It depends on if it's not mutually exclusive. Okay. But and means multiply, or means add. This formula is going to be important to have in your notes also. So you draw a card from a deck. State whether it's mutually exclusive or not, and then calculate. So the probability of drawing a 7 or a jack. So think for a second and decide, is it theoretically possible to pull out one card and get one that is a 7 and a jack? I have never seen a 7 jack. right? So these are mutually exclusive. So the probability is just going to be the probability of drawing a 7 and adding the probability of a jack. Probability of 7. There are four 7s, one for each suit out of the 52 cards. There are four jacks out of the 52 cards. So there are eight out of 52 that, may, that would make me happy. And that makes sense, right? If I want to draw a 7 or a jack, think about how many of those are in the deck. Well, there's four 7s and four jacks, so eight cards will make me happy. There are 52 total. The reason we're keeping these both 52 and not making this one a 51 is because we're only talking about one event, right? These are not, this is not a compound event. Only one thing is happening. We're not drawing two cards. If we were drawing two cards, we might lower this one to 51, but we're only drawing one card. That's the important thing to remember here. Okay, so I can reduce this. I could divide them both by 4, and that's a 2 out of 13. 2 divided by 13 is 15.4%. 0.154. All right, number two, a spade or a nine. Think for a second. Can you get both of those things in one card? I think so. I think you can have a nine. I am not good at drawing spades. That's not going to get, we're not going to even try it. The nine of spades. How about that? So I need the probability of drawing a spade plus the probability of drawing a nine minus the probability of drawing the nine of spades because it is possible to get both of these things at the same time. How many spades are there in the deck? There should be 13, right? How many nines are in the deck? Well, there should be four of them. So this would make it look like 17 cards in the deck will make me happy. But remember, one of those we just counted twice. There's only 13 spades total. One of them is the nine. So I need to subtract the one card in the entire deck that is the nine of spades. So I'm going to get 16 out of 52, or divide them both by 4, 4 out of 13, which we did this once before, but 4 thirteenths is 30.8%. You get 0 0.30769. So it rounds that up to 30.8. Okay. All right, last one. State whether this is mutually exclusive or not, and then calculate. 
So quality control for a TV manufacturer has determined that 3% of its TVs have video problems, 1% experience audio problems, and 0.2% experience both video and audio problems. What is the probability that a TV will experience either video, there's the keyword, or audio problems? Okay, so take a second and try and figure out if these if this is a mutually exclusive situation or not mutually exclusive, and then figure out the probability that a TV has video or audio problems. Pause it and then come back. Okay, so hopefully you first figured out that these are not mutually exclusive. You could have video and audio problems. So I need the probability of video problems minus the probability, oh sorry, plus the probability of audio problems minus the probability of both. So the probability of video problems is 3%, so 0 0.03. Probability of audio problems is 0 0.01, 1%, there's the 3%, minus 0.02% both. So that's 0 0.002. Okay, so 0 0.03 plus 0 0.01 minus 0 0.002 should give you 0 0.038 or 3.8%. Now the question, why would they care? It, notice it says which might affect the warranty. They're going to offer a warranty on their TVs and say, hey, we guarantee that these TVs work just fine. They want to know, they're going to tell you that you can replace it for free, but they want to estimate how many they're going to have to replace. Um, at, you know, because they're going to lose money on that. So they want to have an idea of how much they're going to have to spend replacing broken TVs. So it's important to them to know which, what percent are going to come out with um, audio or video problems because that means that 3.8% of their TVs are going to need to be replaced and that's going to cost them money, right? 3% will have video problems, 1% will have audio problems, 0.2% will have both. So there's a total of 3.8% that are going to be broken in at least one way. Some of these might be broken in two ways and some will just be broken in one way. You're on to homework. Good luck. Have a great day.